Nick, do you think that your approach to politics right now is genuinely going to change things? I just saw him tweeting about you today about something with Joe Kent, that you said you were going to get yeah. Joe Kent to lose the election, and then he ended up um, doing all right. So, like, do you, do you worry that you've kind of gotten a false confidence from having so many yes men around you that maybe you do need a wider audience to have the political effect that you actually want to have? And we got a and front it was, page. It was because he was not going hard against illegal immigration. That was the reason? No, it's because after AFPAC 3, he put out a tweet and he said, um, you know, I disavow AFPAC. I disavow Nick Fuentes. And as far as the Joe Kent thing went, I was never under the illusion necessarily that we were going to be the number one thing defeating Kent. And here's why. And so the limited objective here was to say, we want people to think twice. If I say I disavow Christian nationalism, am I going to get this campaign, which was ridiculous. It was meant to be sensational and ridiculous. Joe Kent, CIA. Do you think that the way that your approach... Sorry, Stephen, I feel like I'm like locking you out of this conversation and just interviewing Nick. We've spoken lots, but I'm, I'm just... here to hang so out in a shitster, so this is good. In a while. I'm channeling my inner Dan here, okay? I'm making you guys hate each other. I'll bring up the Can't woman both. question later so that we can all fight, okay? Um, but... Nick, do you think that your approach to politics right now is genuinely going to change things? Or are you just kind of enjoying the Kali Yuga, so to speak? Uh, yeah, I, I think it will. And, and here's why. Because I actually put a lot of thought into this. You know, when I dropped out of college, my parents got all on my case. And they're like, you need to get a job or go back to school and this and that. And, and I told them, I said, look, I mean, there's two options I could go with here. I could infiltrate the system and I could, you know, play my cards close to the chest and not say all my views. And, and I could get a job at Daily Wire or whatever and, and climb the ladder. I said, or I could do what I'm doing now, which is exist independently of the system. And what I determined back then, I think this is changing now, is that infiltrating and subverting the system is is in some ways impossible in the kind of way that people in media think they can do it. Because, you know, let's say hypothetically, I go into the system, I get a job, I, I don't say all my, my honest views, and I build up a platform. My platform's dependent on the system. So a lot of people think you could build this platform using the, the resources of the establishment, flip a switch 10 years down the road, and say, oh, actually, I was a secret uh, reactionary the entire time. Well, and then you see what happens. They pull the rug out from under you. They bury you. They hit your reputation. And so I said, we don't have time to drag through the institutions. We don't have time for a 20-year march through the institutions. Also, they'll see us coming. Also, when we reveal ourselves, they're going to pull the rug out from under us. I said, so what we need to do is build something parallel next to, independent of the establishment, and build something that will either influence the establishment from the outside, or eventually the establishment will move further to the right and encompass what we're doing. And that's kind of what's happened. Like, Groyper War was the perfect example. Charlie Kirk is going out there, and, and I keep using this example because it's like, you know, one of, one of the best examples of it, is we go out there, and, and he's doing his campus tour, and he's saying, I'm this right-wing, uh, you know, shock jock or whatever. I, I'm this guy who's going to speak truth to the lefties. And he's expecting questions from the left, and we go there and say, hey, actually, you're not, you're not anti-immigration enough. You're not socially conservative enough. And as a consequence, he changed his position, which is a very consequential thing. He changes his position on immigration and says, you know what, I'm not in favor of mass immigration now. I'm in favor of restricted immigration. He did that after that but campaign, and now it's like totally unrecognizable. Wouldn't, and even, sorry, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, wouldn't that pressure be more significant if you had a larger audience? And as much as it's difficult to do, um, I'm gonna, actually I'll wait to bring up the woman question in a minute here, because obviously I wanna talk about the fact that you disclude women from your, your movement. Um, but like I saw Medicare was after you today. You guys really have some beef, hey, you and you and Medicare. Um, and he was tweeting Not out really. that, Oh, I just saw him tweeting about you today about something with Joe Kent that you said you were going to get yeah. Joe Kent to lose the election and then he ended up um, doing all right. So, like, do you do you worry that you've kind of gotten a false confidence from having so many yes men around you that maybe you do need a wider audience to have the political effect that you actually want to have and maybe even like normal people? Not to say your audience aren't normal. I, I actually, well, they, no, they are, are normal. Are they? You'd be surprised. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, um, but like women, like some women maybe, because they vote, like you know? They well, vote. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. not. Voting. 
Whether, but whether lady, you like it or not, not. <laughs> it's not about who votes. It's about who counts the votes, and it's about who runs, and it's about who operates. Um, and, and I'll say there's a few issues here. About the larger audience, you know, the biggest, I have a very large audience for being a reactionary right-wing streamer. I'm one of the, if you subtract people from Fox News, and in other words, people that are on channels, on pre-existing channels, I'm one of the biggest right-wing streamers, period. I don't know that if, even if you look at some of these other guys, if they started their own YouTube channel on YouTube, if they started their own Twitch channel, and those are major platforms, they wouldn't get... Uh, an audience as big as mine, a live audience. And yeah, I mean, and you understand it's different uploading videos and getting 100,000 views versus streaming and yeah. getting five, six, 7,000 concurrent viewers. As far as the live streaming audience, there, there are not a lot of people bigger than me that are not on Fox News or Blaze TV and, and getting the audience that comes from that. What's more is I'm censored from everything. And the thing is, you can't, it's very difficult to talk about the things that are necessary to talk about without running a file of censorship. It's almost impossible. And I made that decision years ago. The restrictions were tightening, and it, it got to the point where the things I say on my show regularly fell outside the bounds of the more restricted TOS. And I said, well, I could either say 70% of what I want to say and keep my channel, or I could keep doing my show and, and deal with the censorship. And I chose the latter because when you can't talk about COVID and elections and BLM and you can't talk about conspiracies and you can't, you can't bully people, I can't do that show. And so at that point, what am I doing? Like YouTube and li liberal YouTube is controlling the content of my videos and my streams. And I said, at that point, it's just a redundancy. There's a million shows talking about tax cuts and, and generic, you know, soft America first type stuff. I need to do the show that no one is doing. I'm the only one saying the things I'm saying to this day. I'm the only one that was pro-Russia. I'm the only one that, that went as far on a lot of these things, which was necessary. So as far as having a bigger audience, the only way I could, I, I have one of the bigger audiences in the right wing, and the only way that it could even get bigger is if I was on the platforms, which is just a contradiction. As far as the yes men thing, I disagree with that. I, you know, people say that I have this cult and, you know, that I'm surrounded by sycophants. And I, and I do have a lot of sycophantic people around me. But people that know me firsthand know that when I make decisions, I, I look for criticism. I look for scrutiny. And as far as the Joe Kent thing went, I was never under the illusion necessarily that we were going to be the number one thing defeating Kent. And here's why. Joe Kent got uh, like a huge contribution from Peter Thiel, and he had the backing of the Thiel network. Joe Kent was on Tucker Carlson every week. He was on Bannon every week. He had the endorsement of Trump. He was in a district running against an impeachment Republican. This is an R plus 20 district. It's a solidly red district. You know, and I said that back in February, and I said, look, the goal is we're going to impose a pain mechanism. You can't disavow Christian nationalism. You can't disavow white identity and get away with it. And so the goal was, I mean, do we want him to lose? Absolutely. But more than anything, the goal was to say, you're not going to say those things and then just ride off into the sunset. And we became a headache for their campaign. I mean, we have people that were insiders on the campaign and around D.C. that they did not like the website. It was in the front page of the New York Times. We spent $100 on that effort. It was a hundred. That was a one hundred dollar investment to run that website and to buy those stickers, and we got and a front it was, page. And it was because he was not going hard against illegal immigration. That was the reason. No, it's because after AFPAC three, he put out a tweet and he said, um, "You know, I disavow AFPAC. I disavow Nick Fuentes." Which honestly, I didn't. I didn't care that much about that. It was what he said. He said, "I disavow Nick Fuentes because throwing your religion in people's faces is divisive." And throwing race in people's faces, that's a sideshow. He goes, we need to focus on inclusive populism. And, and there's a real dialectic going on right now after Trump leaves the party, which is, are we going to embrace economic work, nationalism, working class populism, or are we going to embrace uh, Christian nationalism or something, or, or American nationalism, something more reactionary. That's a real thing that's going on right now. Bannon, Tucker, and others are articulating was, this was idea. Was there another that, candidate that you were supporting or were you just attacking him? Because I think that's a, yeah. so what, what was the other candidate? Paul Gosar, Wendy okay. Rogers, that, Terry that Lake, was, okay. Lake Masters. Running, running against him? No, no, no. Running against Kent. Oh. No, we were in support. No, we, we told people to vote for any, there weren't any other good candidates. Um, Heidi St. John wasn't great. Mm. Butler was an impeachment Republican. But here's the thing. We said, you know, 
So wouldn't that be we, helping the Democrats to go against his campaign then? It's not about Republicans and Democrats, Lauren. It's about Joe Kent is a young guy who is a good looking guy. And he, you know, he's going to be a leader in Congress. We're going to have to deal with this guy now because he is young and he's handsome and he's articulate. And, I, and I, you know, I, you got to give the devil their due. And he's going to go in there and, and hijack the Trump succession and say, actually, Trumpism is about inclusive populism. That is far more toxic than like a standard lame Republican, which is Bueller so, or the other. So like in Canada, we had this situation where basically the conservative party brought in a leader that was essentially a progressive leftist, pro-vaccine mandates, like Canada is all about diversity is our strength, this, that, and the other, and a bunch of conservatives voted for Maxime Bernier instead to kind of send a message to the Conservative Party that you have to be more like this if you want to get our votes. And it quite genuinely tipped the election results in multiple um, provinces across Canada. Multiple candidates that were Conservatives would have won their seats had people not voted for the People's Party of Canada. But like, to me, that is giving a solid messaging of this is what we want to see. Right. This Maxime Bernier guy who's standing up for regular working class Canadians, who's against the vaccine mandates. Um, and it wasn't just telling them what we don't want to see. I think that's some of the problem that I have with the approach of constantly attacking the Republican establishment who need to be attacked because they're they're not doing much. Right. They're just sitting on a treadmill, letting the world be run by progressives or supporting them when they can. Um but that you have to offer an alternative. And sometimes I wonder what your alternative is, because it just seems like it's just mocking everything. We do have an alternative. I run an annual conference. I run a conference Yeah, yeah but who year. is your alternative candidate that you would like to see? I, you've named a few. Blake Masters, I've met him. He's a good guy, right? Um, you've named a few, but I guess in one of those Joe Kent situations, it would have been cool to have a candidate that you were telling people to put their votes forward. But I guess not always, uh, well, the, not this, always this, possible. Uh, this transpired in, in March. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, you can't, you can't organize and, and running for a federal congressional office is a big undertaking. It's not, it's not quite so simple as, oh, this guy disavowed us. Oh, okay. Here's a candidate that we're going to, um, that we're going to run. And, and again, the goal was very limited. You know, the goal was extremely limited and that's why it was a success. I mean, the grand slam would have been Kent losing, but yeah, obviously <laughs> there's millions of dollars pouring into the district. We spent a hundred bucks on this thing. We're going up against billionaires and millions and Tucker and Bannon and, and all these players that, that want to get, and Trump himself endorsing Kent and even Gosar for that matter. The limited objective was to say, look, we want to send a message to Kent and to everybody else that if you disavow Christian nationalism, like we, we're a faction in the party. You can't, you can't keep hitting right. And you say, like, I supported Joe Kent until he attacked us first. You know, I had a call with Joe Kent. I had a call with the candidate and wanted to support him and was going to put up money behind him. And then he went out of his way with no provocation to say, oh, we don't like AFPAC. It's too Christian. It's too white. It needs to be more inclusive. It needs to be more multiracial. And I said, okay, well, here's, here's the problem. Is all these Republicans, you know, they will... It costs them nothing, and they don't think twice about attacking people to their right. They don't think twice about throwing someone under the, under the bus if they could save their own skin and say, well, that guy's a real white supremacist. I'm one of the good ones. And so the limited objective here is to say, we want people to think twice. If I say I disavow Christian nationalism, am I going to get this campaign, which was ridiculous. It was meant to be sensational and ridiculous. Joe Kenna, CIA. Am I going to get something like this in my district? People showing up to my town halls, stickers, a website. They're under my replies, going viral, mm -hmm. digging up all my dirt. And we did have that effect. We have people on campaigns across the country, and they said, and I've heard this, that candidates are, are saying, oh, I don't want to disavow Nick because I saw it happen to Joe Kent. But that and makes it sound that personal, right? That sound that makes it sound a bit personal. Uh, but anyways, I, you know, I'm done with my my questions. I will bring up the woman question at some point, but I want to give the floor to Stephen because uh, we've kind of just sat him in the corner for a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just hanging out, playing video games. I got free content. You guys print me money right now. Okay, great. Bro, awesome. we we love Steve. Let's talk about Steven. let's talk about this conversation. Okay. Mm. We're what? Both Nick, what were we going to talk okay. about Stephen with? No. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Hold on. Okay, you're asking a question as a challenger's position, and then he's responding, and then you guys aren't pushing it any further. But he didn't actually answer any of your your actual questions. Yeah, I so did. They were, no, you didn't. You were fucking dancing around All right, this let's, bullshit. Let's hear it then. Yeah. Steven. So the question is: the question is, 
from Lauren, okay? Because I don't give a fuck. I hope all your movements fail because you guys are abhorrent people. But <laughs> Lauren's question was, do you think that by being more exclusive with the type of audience that you appeal to, do you inhibit your ability to grow to an effective political size? And you didn't really address that. You just kind of so talk about, yeah. When you say exclusive, do you mean like women? Because she hinted at that. Or do you mean something else like people like Joe Cat? I don't know. That was the original question. And then you didn't really, neither of you let's, really Let's got bring it. up the woman question. Let's let's just okay. uh, throw that Boring. social wow. hand grenade in there. You guys can't even do disagreements. No, it's, it's well, well, we're going to disagree on this. Cowardly! Oh well, my here, god! I want to answer the Stephen. Unbelievable! Question about, about okay, says, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. Okay, here. Okay, let me. Let me okay, I'll monologue for two seconds. Okay. Right. So here's an okay. issue that I see sometimes. Okay, you have political movements, and what will happen is, is they will stake incredibly hardline positions on things that don't really win them any voters, but it can lose them a lot of. Did Steven's so camera my... just disappear for everyone else, or just mine? Yeah, he's being absorbed into the blockchain. Yeah, uh, CIA yeah, took him here. out. You see me? Before I see he could both give of you, you good advice. Fine. Was it all a dream? Was he ever real? He's actually it, just yeah, an animated character I that the government created. Right he's a VTuber. He just got busted. <laughs> there he is. There's my, that hello? handsome face. My shit is working the whole time, but you guys are the ones having the. Okay. All right, you're back. Hello? Hello. Am I good? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Is it? Sir? They're not trolling, right? Are they trolling? No, you're They're there. Not... No, you're back. We can, we can hear you. Okay. Are you there? Well, now you just took the wind out of my... Yeah, I was about to go on an epic Vosh. Just shut me down. Now I just... What I was going to say is that, that sometimes people stake out really strong political positions on things that don't win them very much support, but they can lose so much support on them, right? So <clears throat> one thing that I... I, I like, I might point out for the Democrats, for instance, like, I don't know if going hard line, we want to ban all the assault rifles and all the guns. I don't think that's a great position because I don't think you win very much support, but you can lose so much doing that. So, like, for your movement, right, there might be a level of unnecessary edginess towards women or minorities or anything else where it's like, if you were to cut it back a little bit, you're not really losing much, but you have so much to gain by I think that's the essence of the question that Lauren posed when it's like, do you think that you're losing a little bit by being a little bit too edgy with your movement and you're sacrificing too much potential growth by just holding on to some like 2016, 2017 edgy era that's bygone politics? Especially when the edginess seems to be memes for the most part. Like, I yeah, think- Yeah, they're not like crucial or integral parts yeah. of your ideologies or your movements. Like if you lost all of it, you wouldn't really be losing much, but the potential upside is huge. I would disagree with, I will say this, um, as, because there's a difference between style and substance. And I will say that as far as edginess goes and style, uh, you know, you're probably right. There's always a balance of, um, you know, what you call edge could also be perceived as uh, as authentic or sensational and it gets clicks. You know how this kind of stuff works. If you say something sensational, you get attraction. I, I know it. better than anybody on this panel how that kind of yeah. stuff works. I promise so, you, right? But so like for an example for my stuff, right? I think that people... I think people see me as a pretty truthful person. I think they see honesty and all that is important, right? I have really honest opinions about some of the insane fucking trans people that I fight with online. But I probably didn't have to talk about any of that over the past year. And I'd still be on Twitch. And I probably wouldn't have lost as much of like the farther left audience I had if I would have just left that issue. And it's not like I needed to dive into that. We didn't have to have, you know, six months of content on trans athletes, HRT for children, and, you know, whether or not you could have neo pronouns and identify as autism gender. I could have left all that alone. I didn't really gain much by diving into it. Theoretically, you could say, well, not theoretically, actually, you could say I lost a lot doing it. So I, I think there's a parallel between that. And like, I can cope to myself and say like, well, I needed to do it because people like me for being edgy, but, but I could be edgy in ways that are like, we could talk about like shitting on conservatives. I mean, do something no, more I've, edgy. No, I've changed my opinion. My if, if, political if, beliefs. I've changed my opinion on this. All of that content was absolutely necessary that you did. Good one. Nice. <laughs> well, no, let me say Yeah, this. go, Nick, go. Okay. Uh, again, style and substance. I, I agree with you that um, does sometimes the style alienate people unnecessarily? Yeah, and, and sometimes I'm just being self-indulgent. I'll agree with you. Like sure. like when I went to AFPAC 3 and I said, oh, they compare Putin to Hitler like that's a bad thing or, or whatever. And they say that like sure. it's a bad thing. That was needlessly self-indulgent. I agree sure. with that. Um, but, as, but as far as substance, um, I, I disagree because there are edgy things that I say that are a part of the platform and they are shocking and they are heterodox and they do need to be said. And there's there are areas where sometimes saying things, again, that are calculated and shocking, but based in substance, they can't have a value. And I look at Trump. Trump is really the model 
for all right-wing people. Trump is the only successful visionary right-wing movement in this century since Reagan. And, and I know you don't think very highly of Trump, but you know what was the vision before Trump ran in 2016. The vision for Republicans was something like, uh, you know, fiscal responsibility, boring, lame. Trump gets in and says, make America great again, which is a visionary statement. It says, you know, America was great. It's not anymore. We can restore it. And this is something that that is uh, something that elevates the conversation in there about that. Again, I know you don't think very highly of him, but it, it did change well, the paradigm were... and created something that didn't exist. And, and let me just say this yeah. before you go on. Mm -hmm. So when he announces and says they're bringing drugs, crime, they're rapists, everybody said the same thing to Trump. And they said, oh, you're going to lose all your support. You can't say that. You just hit a 10% ceiling. But he went up. And then he said, we're going to ban Muslims from America. You know, I'm calling for complete and total shutdown of Muslims entering America. And he went up in the polls. Now, I'm not saying it would be a false lesson to say or a false extrapolation to say edgy equals successful and always saying is edgy and always raising the stakes always means more support but there is something to be said about in a calculated way in a tactical way taking an unpopular position which may be more popular than people think and maybe saying it in a way that's edgy enough to get attention but not actually really that edgy when you think about it there's a way that trump hacked the conversation which i think people agree was successful and, and it's, I don't want to say balanced, but it was it was almost skillful and precise in a way where he derived a benefit from things that were counterintuitive. And that's what I try to do. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Uh, and sometimes it's a self-indulgent. But I would defend the strategy of, of you know, we always, because the reverse would be to say, we need to keep our language perfectly clean. And yeah, so, keep okay, our... yeah, let's, okay, let's, let's get rid of the retard thoughts, okay? I'm not saying okay. that, okay? I, you know who I am. Everybody here knows who all three of us is. We know um, you. Except for Lauren, who's sold out, okay? So we, we know, like, where we stand on, like, edgy <laughs> language and stuff, for okay? Nothing. So I'm not here to tell you that, like, oh, you need to be fucking boring. But I love that you brought up Trump, because I think Trump was a really, really good example. So I think that you have, like, your normal kind of, like, political toolbox of propaganda, of advertisements, of appealing to different sides and attacking different people. And if you want... You can put that aside and you can dig into like the special toolbox. The special toolbox is what Trump took out. And that's got things like name calling, saying things you probably shouldn't say, um, taking positions that are a little bit too edgy, staking out strong spots on things that don't even win you support but could hurt you, like saying women should be arrested for um, having abortions, right? Trump did that. So that special toolbox has incredibly powerful tools. But the problem is, while there's a huge upside to those tools, to being able to wield them in an effective manner, I think there's a huge downside too. And I think Trump has run into that multiple times. There were times when Trump, he did this during the campaign trail and then it, it disappeared during his presidency. There were times during the campaign trail when he was running in the primaries where Trump actually showed flashes of maybe what he was like as a younger man, where when he lost a primary to either Cruz or whatever, he would get on stage and say, you know what? They fought hard, they did really well, and I respect him, they did good in that. And when he said things like that, I was like, this is a really intelligent man that knows when to turn it on and knows when to turn it off. And I actually had a lot of respect for him. And I kept thinking, it was like, man, you know, worst case scenario, if Trump does become president, this is a very intelligent man that, that, that knows how to apply pressure in the perfect way, but can pull back and be mm -hmm. a statesman when necessary, which is like a key skill set for any leader, right? You need to know when you can apply pressure and when you need to ease off a little bit to win support. But the problem is that, and I kind of wonder in the same way that like every communist leader, except for like fucking Che Guevara, every, every communist person eventually becomes a self-indulgent lunatic who wants to be a dictator. It feels like the people that engage in our forms of hyperbolic language also lose themselves in themselves and become self-indulgent losers, right? So I think like I've done this in the past where you, in the beginning, like I need the edge because I'm selling a message and I'm doing it in a way nobody else is. And then you get people that will gather around you for it, but eventually you kind of get, you get swallowed up by and lost in that edge to where, you know, like a, a year later, you know, you might be saying some shit like, you know, a white nationalist should be mowing down BLM protesters and fucking, <laughs> and fucking Kenosha or whatever, right? Where all of a sudden you're like, shit, what, how the fuck did this get so far away from? Or in your case, you know, saying like, hey, who said, you know, being like, Hitler is a bad thing, you know? You're, you're making these comments. And so I wonder if like, I feel, and, and Trump now today, now regardless of how your audience or anybody feels about Trump, I feel this strongly. And I bet most even Trump fanatics feel on the inside. Trump looks like a loser when he's still crying about the election. 
That's something that, like, for all of his messaging, he needs to just let that go and move on. He can talk about the Make America Great, the wall or whatever, but every single time this guy gets on stage, he's crying about how the election was stolen, and it makes him look like a loser, which isn't normally how Trump presents himself, you know? I think he could do his little song and dance after the election for a while after, but to still be going on about it today? At some point, I have to wonder, are you making strategic decisions to, like, razor focus your rhetoric in the most pressure-intensive way possible, or are you just like a self-indulgent loser who's gotten lost in themselves? in my opinion. Yeah, oh, I'll say, I like I said, I agree that, um, you know, and, and like I said, I've been self-indulgent in the past and there's a tendency to do that. But I also think the conversations may be more fundamentally about, you know, what we're actually trying to achieve. And and Lauren said earlier about women, you know, oh, uh, well, women vote and all this. And, and the thing is, like, I'm not running for office. Now, I may run for office in the future and that's a different conversation. But the question is, what are we trying to achieve and how do we get how do we get what we desire, which is we want to shape the society. We want to change the way society runs. And how do you do that? And and there's and I'm oversimplifying here, but it's a it's a helpful way to think about it. My way of thinking about it is you could sort of come out here with a, a weaker message, weaker in style, weaker in substance, and you could probably have more money and have more people in there by appealing to a broader audience and appealing to a lower common denominator. You could, on the other hand, say something very heavy and very intense and very brash, and you could appeal maybe to a smaller crowd. You know, people are going to be turned off by it. It's exclusive. But the people that you appeal to, it's going to be, it's, it's sort of like the candle that uh, burns twice as bright and half as long, so to speak. And the, and the point, and, I, and that's not a perfect analogy because it says that there's this relationship between the intensity and the duration, but, mm -hmm. but the point is, it's more intense and it, although exclusive, it's more intense and maybe can exert a comparable level of power. And I think you could certainly see that with the Groypers. Where the Groypers, we don't have the funding that Turning Point does. Turning Point has $40 million in funding. We don't have anything near that. Okay, and, and Tucker Carlson is at Fox News, which is a, I mean, he's pulling, what, 4 million viewers per night. We don't get anywhere near that. But you could say, arguably, that the Groypers are punching well above their weight based on our relative size. Everybody in Capitol Hill knows about the Groypers. Everybody mm -hmm. in, in the right wing knows about the Groypers. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're, we're targeting, we're looking for zealots. We're looking for people that are intense. We're looking for people that are going to, that this is going to be the driving thing in their life. We're, we're crusaders. We're not looking for casual participants who are going to be turned off and say, mm, well, he said this thing, I don't like it. Well, those people aren't going to be the revolutionaries. We need 10,000 revolutionaries. And, and revolutionaries don't care about n-word here, a Hitler thing there, whatever. They care about passion and they care about inspiration and they care about the message. And so is there a self-indulgence that, that doesn't have a benefit? Absolutely. But I think that it's, I care less about that because I'm not looking for the casual. Yeah, you know, I understand. You want like the by. commit, you want the fucking soldiers. But I guess just as one final point and then you can go. Like the, the thing is, is that a more successful version of your movement, in my opinion, was the progressive wing of the Democratic Party um, politically, like four years ago. Like these guys got huge numbers. Bernie Sanders pulled these people out of nothing and they exploded in popularity. And from what I've seen, all of that political everything was completely squandered. They purity tested themselves out of existence. The more successful candidates they had, like AOC moderated, even if she is really far left, candidates they tried to run, like Nina Turner, that were more well-funded than the opposition they ran against, all lost. The Justice Dems went from supporting like 100 candidates to like seven. Like everything in that political movement evaporated because of how hardcore they focused their messaging. And those guys were 100 times larger than your movement. Not to shit on the size of your movement. I'm, I'm a small person too. But like they were so big, but it feels like they, they were so focused on that zealot message. Like, we're not going to compromise. We're not going to, we're going to remain as ideological peer as possible. And now where are they? What do the progressives have to show for it in the United States? Like they have no pressure on Biden. Everything that Biden does is aimed towards Manchin and cinema, which are the more centrist things. All of the elections we're looking at now are trying to win over Republican or independent voters. Like nobody's listening to these people in these D plus 40 districts. Nobody cares what they have to think. And they're, and all of their media personalities are like extremist losers and nobody cares about it anymore. Like it just, it feels like all of the excitement for that movement basically completely dried up because of how extremely pure and radical they were. Say though that it, that's not how it's working out with America First, because I mean, you look at congressmen like Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene; they're moving closer to us. Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's like the most famous, influential Republican congressperson in the House right now, and she's out there saying Christian nationalism. She spoke, she spoke at AFPAC three. 
And um, and so I, I don't I don't necessarily see it the same way. Also, we've got to contend with censorship in a way that the left never has. So I mean that that's a limiting factor also. And the left and the right are different. It's not perfectly comparable because the left and the right face different structural challenges. The left has to deal with saturation from big money and corporations. The right has to deal with that, plus censorship. Plus, they have to deal with uh, you know debanking, financial sanction, which makes it very difficult. Also, the left has a tendency to to want to embrace their progressives to the extent that they can, or be perceived as doing so. The right does not embrace their extreme. They they run from the extremes or the perceived extremes. So I'll say there's different. Str it's not a perfect comparison, although I see what you're saying. I would say that. You know, where I don't I don't know that our influ I think our influence is large because of our style. I wouldn't say that our influence is not larger in spite of what we're doing or because of what we're doing, if that makes sense. I think you're limiting the type of people you can have in your movement, though. So, like, let's say I were born a man with all of the wonderful things that come with being a man, like uh, being able to join the Groyper movement. I wouldn't do it. There we go. Because you explicitly say you're looking for zealots. And it's not necessarily that I don't like passion in politics. I do. That's important. We need more of it. So many people are just doing surface level politics that is purely for what they're supposed to say to the papers, what they're supposed to say to get the check mark from their, you know, publicists and everything. But when a movement is based on zealotry, people who have a bit of wisdom, I'm not saying I'm wise, I just have a bit of life experience, they know that these people can turn on you on a pinpoint because you questioned the leader of the movement, whatever it might be, even what on what may be a legitimate point, they're going to turn on you just as hard as they go against everyone else, which like you've said, the Groypers do a good job of. They're really good with political pressure. They're really good at getting politicians to say, I'm never going to criticize Nick Fuentes because I know I'm going to have this massive group of people coming after me. Um, I know if I said anything or had any questions or had a mind of my own in that movement or, you know, yeah, just proposed something a bit different. Well, that, that it's going to be like Rob's Pierre. You're getting hung at the end of your revolution. And I actually worry for you, Nick, that that might happen to you one day, you know, your own movement hanging you cause you aren't uh, enough of a zealot for them. That seems to be the way these things go. Oh, I'll agree with you that they're, um, that's the risk that you run. I mean, every, every sort of way that you go about it. Here, here's here's what I disagree with. I disagree with this mindset where people say, um, this this kind of thing has these benefits and these risks. Well, it has these risks, so it's gotta change. Any way that you do something is gonna have its structural benefits and its its uh, risks. You know, if, if, I were, if I were just sort of like a boring guy, I probably wouldn't have an audience. If I wasn't funny, if I wasn't sensational, if I didn't say the things that people constantly criticize me for saying, I wouldn't, I would never have an audience. You know, people talk about the negative. What about the positive? I was on YouTube. I transferred my entire audience to DLive. I transferred most of my audience from DLive to a proprietary platform, which not many people can say that they've done something like that. That's because of the loyalty of the people that follow me. It's because of the zealotry thing I'm talking about, which fits with the fact that the message I'm pushing is extreme and heterodox and revolutionary. And so, you know, you could say, oh, well, there's risks associated with that approach. There's, there's, Things that can't happen, certainly, but probably mm. this this is the best way to do it. And uh, and I'll say this: I'm here. You know, all the dissident right people over the past six, seven years, they're not here anymore. You know, the yeah. the Spencers, the Heimbachs, all those characters, they're not here. I am. You know, I retain my audience. I retain my following. Afpac three is three times bigger than Afpac two. There, it's successful. And I, I, I look at the success of the movement and I say, that's the proof that we're doing something right. And once you start to pick, because I'll admit, I, I'll say something about this. You know, when you say, oh, is it a little self-indulgent and, and this and that? It's not things that I haven't considered. I've totally considered it. But consider this. It's sort of like you get so far and once you start looking at something that's working and picking it apart and, and swapping things out, do you accidentally subtract some of the things that got you that far in the first place? It's like new Coke. You know, Coca-Cola is going so far, they're in this war with Pepsi, and they say, well, we need a totally new flavor, and it blows up. It's like, why don't you stick to what got you to be Coke in the first place? And that's how I feel. And and I, I think that, I don't think there's actually, because, I mean, I don't think you give too many examples. I think a lot of the things that are being said are not are not completely fair. I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not... Um, there's always room for improvement and I'm a perfectionist. So I, that's why I'm agreeing with you guys. But I think for the most part, 
I think that I'm very tactful. I think I'm I'm very uh, adept at managing it. And as far as zealotry goes, you know, zealotry is a good thing. That's what we need. That's that's the only thing. Because think of the risks. We're talking about overturning the liberal consensus, which requires people to make tremendous sacrifice. People are not going to be willing to make tremendous sacrifice for something that they kind of don't believe in, and they're sort of halfway in, halfway out. It's just what it's called for. If I were calling for people to vote Republican and I was like voting for Mitch McConnell, then yeah, I could probably just be like, hey, everybody, Joe Biden's mentally ill. Nobody, okay, wait, just if you're going to engage with it, don't, there, there doesn't have to be like, oh, like, you know, I don't know if I should be a zealot or if I should be a total fucking sellout. Right. right. That's that's a yeah. that's a that's the boring dichotomy. Nobody's presenting that. OK. And also you can do whatever you want, because I don't give a fuck at the end of the day, because it's your fucking movement. And I hope you guys fucking fail. But the, the, the here's like a huge problem we have as humans. OK, this is a, this is like a, a it's a cognitive bias that we have. If we do something and we're improving or if we're doing well, we think that nothing that we're doing is inhibiting our progress. It's very easy to see when you're succeeding and it's very easy to see when you're failing. But it's really difficult to see if you could succeed more. Right. Like there are things that I could go back in my career and if I could just delete one or two statements, I would have no impact basically on how edgy I'm seen, on how authentic I'm seen. But I would have an immensely positive impact on how other people see me uh, in terms of like if I could delete like one or two or three or four or 20 edgy statements. Like there are certain things I could get rid of and be totally fine. I don't think that that means that you have to be like, oh, well, I'm a total sellout fucking loser. Or and, and every time you say that, it makes me think that you're a little bit scared to engage with the criticism, honestly, because 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 honestly, Nick. I see a younger me in you, okay? A scared, autistic, Hispanic boy, okay, who has <laughs> issues. But like, those statements are, in my opinion, and, I, and I'm only saying this, I'm not even attacking you, I'm attacking my former self. Those are my cope statements. When somebody's like, don't you think you could tune down the edginess just a little bit? I'm like, no, that's an important part of who I am. Really? Could anybody just go up and be edgy? Is that really the most central part of your character is just making unnecessarily edgy statements? There's not like a few areas where you could trim back and not only succeed as much as you are, but maybe even shoot a little bit higher. Because I think that there are times where even though what you're doing is working and it could be fine, it could be a little bit better. But at the end of the day, that's that's your call. Like I said, like I said, I, I think that you, uh, I think that if you wanted to go over everything I've ever said and, and find some things that are self-indulgent. I think I agree with you, like I said. But I think that, again, the question is, you know, what is the presentation going to be? Because if you're talking about, you know, a few things which are regrettable, like I said, deleting a couple of clips versus changing the entire style. I mean, my style is confrontational. My style is provocative. And, and almost necessarily so. Um, and like I said, the left and the right are, are structurally different. To be in this right-wing scene, I mean, we, we're militantly against the current establishment. So it's not all just it's not all just edginess for edginess sake. When I say that women shouldn't vote, I'm not being edgy. I believe that. You know, I make a joke about Hitler or whatever. When I say the N-word, it's like, is that self-indulgent? Totally. When I say that, like, you know, race and IQ and the Jewish power stuff, like, that's all legit. And I say it in a funny way. I, I do it. The delivery may be ironic. The delivery may be funny. Um, and so, and sometimes it's exaggerated and sometimes it's, it's a sure. complete joke. I mean, like I see there are things hard. where you do it where you, you have like gotten better. So like in the Sneeko thing that came up, the idea of race and IQ. And I feel like the Nick of like four years ago would have harped on like, listen, black people are dumb. Asian people are smart. White people are creative. Whatever your stereotypes are, you'd be like, that's it. But you didn't. You Now you have better messaging on it. You're like, listen, different people have different strengths. You know, some people have higher IQ. Some people do some things better. I think everybody should have, right? You, you ch even though you didn't lose really the edge because you still have the same essence of your wacky fucking race realist beliefs, but at the very least, you found a way to package it in a way that seems beneficial to everybody you're talking about rather than elevating like your own status and then attacking other people for it. I, I think that's like a good example of like changing your messaging slightly while holding onto the essence of what you're saying to keep your fan base captivated in my opinion oh it's true and and you know um you know and i'm not going to be totally defensive I, I i will say that i um my point here because i'm not trying to say that there's you have to be a sellout or you have to be a total edgelord what i'm just trying to say is there is a value in there is a value in humor there is a value in in edgy i i believe that although it can be self-indulgent i agree say at the same time and you and you said this is why you or maybe it's not why but you've commented on this um, that, you know, my, my form has changed a little bit, that it's not what it used to be. And I'll agree, you know, I, I'm a mature, I'm a more mature person than I was when I started doing this when I was 18 years old. And I agree with you. Are, are there things that I regret saying so many years ago? Uh, you know, if I could delete them, yeah, it probably would make my life a little bit easier. But I also believe that 
If you're a target, you're a target. I think that you're a target because of what you say and do. And I think that if it wasn't one thing that you said, it'd be some other thing. That I you know said. what you're saying. And yeah, I don't, because now I feel like we're kicking Lauren out of the corner. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Like, I just, as a final thing, like, I so understand everything you're here. saying because I've said all the same things. But again, I think they're cope. Because I'll say that every time I get caught doing something stupid, because I'll do something, I'll say something stupid, and somebody like, bro, what? you just didn't have to say this one thing. And everything you're saying is like, come on, like, they'll attack me no matter what. No matter what I say, someone's going to come after me anyway. If it wasn't this sense, it would have been this sense. If it wasn't that, it would have been that. But at the end of the day, we all know that, like, Fuck, if you just wouldn't have said that one thing, you'd be in a way better position. And here's the final thought I'll leave you with, and then you guys, and then we can all do whatever, okay? Here's the final thought that I'll leave with you with, okay? Um, it took my YouTube editor to point this out. It was one of the most important things he's ever told me, is that when you say or do something that is contradictory to your values, to the things that you say are important, so for me, it's misinformation online, okay? And there have been times where I'm like, I think this guy faked the thing or whatever. I didn't know, and I just made it up because I was fucking mad at some dude. When you do things like that, you don't hurt yourself necessarily. You do a little bit. And you don't hurt like your overall movement or you don't hurt like potentially new fans. The people that end up getting hurt the most are the people that do look up to you that really defend you. Because those people do keep an eye on everything you do. They do run to comment sections to defend you. They do talk about you in other forums. And then when they see you act in contrary to the things that you believe or the things that you think are important, those are the ones that end up like scratching their head the most. We're like, well, fuck, I thought that he knew better than this. Or I thought that he like could have avoided this type of thing. And then those are the ones that end up getting the most mindfuck. And that's what I try to keep in mind now, I guess, when I'm like interacting with certain people on the internet. It's a good point, actually. That's a good point. Um, it's going to be yeah, uh, really great when Nick implements all this stuff and becomes president of the United States and does a thank you speech <laughs> to you, Stephen, for uh, giving him all of this wonderful advice to further his political career. I could. Well, at that point, Destiny will be on board. Destiny will be my vice I'll president. I have some kind of cabinet position. <laughs> Pete Buttigieg was the Department of Transportation guy, right? I'm sure you can find some place for him. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. You, for all your uh, factorial experience will be put yeah, to true. use. True. Absolutely. <laughs> Secretary of Transportation. No, um, well, and I, and I, I, think you, I think you're right about that. I, I will say that, um, I mean, I stand by what I've said and done, but, um, but you know, these are things that I've heard, and I agree with some of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's about I think it's a great point about the people that defend you the most, because that's true. And that's something I've thought about a lot as well, because, you know, as a leader um, and I, I realize this, too, because, you know, I really just kind of do what I want. I, I am completely independent and it's a double edged sword. I could do whatever I want. I could do whatever I want. And, you know, when you're beholden to like a company, it's like, oh, well, I can't say this. They told me I can't. When you're independent, you really can just do whatever you like. And for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined. I'm more disciplined, I think, than most people. Um, but I, I feel like for a long time, I was going out there and kind of just doing what I felt like doing. And I feel like in the past couple of years, I've said, I've got a responsibility, you know, because you're right. There are people who look up to me. There are, I, I am a leader of people. And so it's, it's not just me that I have to think about. I may want to go out and do this thing and say that thing, but, you know, how's that going to affect everybody else? So mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. And that's that's part of why you and I are so mature, Stephen. That's why we're becoming we're becoming better people and less toxic and yeah, we're gonna true. heal the divide. Okay. Yep, not so, me over here as a woman. I'm just nope. gonna fan those shut flames. Up. <laughs> I'm just gonna divide everyone <laughs> no. even